Hey everyone, it's time to talk about London Real and Brian Rose again because... Today, I am announcing my plans to become your next mayor of London. Yes, that's right. Brian Rose is running for mayor of London and guess what? He wants you to donate. Give us your email address below to lend your support and I will send you my first official policy video as well as a link on how to volunteer and donate to my campaign. Since I made the first few films about this back in April, I've been approached by so many people with stories. People who did the courses feeling they were ripped off, former employees, but I've resisted doing anything on it until now. Originally, I was interested because the story tapped into so many of the most important issues, free speech and censorship, and most importantly, how that conversation itself, that sacred value of free speech, could itself be weaponized for financial gain. And what's been happening with London Real and Brian Rose over the last few months highlights a few other big topics we've covered on this channel. You know, here's the culty cult checklist. Like, this is the things not to do. So the first one is, does the leader grab the one ring of power? And this is probably the most central um, and non-negotiable one. And why our current system, what some people have called Game A, incentivizes certain ways of being and creates evolutionary niches for bad behavior. And how one of the key things we have to do if we want to transition to a more sustainable way of being is close that niche. So a lot of people, when they think about what's underneath all the problems in the world, they start to think about social architectures. And uh, so one of the social architectures is this kind of game theoretic race to the bottom type scenario where a very small number of sociopaths or sadists or assholes can create a game dynamic that then everyone else is obligated to not just play, but try to play to win. So as before, I'm going to tell the story, play a few clips to try and make sense of it, and talk to a few different people who've been watching closely, people who've been tracking his business tactics. Unfortunately, when you paid your money and uh, you, you actually got onto the course, it became apparent that he was no more interested in in giving you mentoring or support or business or any real valuable business advice. Brian talks about free speech and um, yet uh, the experience that we had certainly on the course was anything but free speech or anything but an open forum for communication. So there's telltale signs. So he's got fake social proof. He's got fake um, followers. And then he's got a cause where he's identified a group that really need a leader or really wants leadership. So he's targeted the vulnerable or that believe in a cause. So let's start with a recap of what's been going on for the last few months since we checked in with London Real and Brian Rose. Last time we were talking about David Icke and the dip into conspiracy land. So he shifted at least a couple of times since then. And as we'll see later in the film, has actually deleted a lot of those films, including some with David Icke, with his new pivot to run for mayor. So last time we checked in, he was facing a massive pushback from his audience and he kept kind of trying to pivot away from YouTube. He framed himself as a free speech martyr for the US right wing circuit, getting big names like Candace Owens, Dave Rubin and Dennis Prager, who he has also deleted. And this pivot worked for some people, including the ultra spiritual comedian JP Sears, who's got around 2 million followers. Who is leading the charge, the premier pioneer in the world, leading the charge against censorship and crusading for freedom of speech? And it's Brian Rose of London Real. So I reached out to him to bring him onto my podcast, to bring him to you so you can help join the movement of making a difference in keeping our freedom of speech and fighting censorship. I've heard you say many times, and I get goosebumps each time I hear you say it, I might not agree with everything you have to say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Why are you willing to stand up for even people being able to speak their minds when you disagree with them? Yeah, so it's a great question. And first of all, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I really appreciate this. He also talked about launching a reality TV show. And finally, last week, announced that he was running for mayor. Donate to my campaign. What I didn't realize when I started making films about this back in the spring was that concerns about London Real's business practices go way back, well before he saw the opportunity for the digital freedom platform. 
Mike Winnett does a show about online entrepreneurs, or what he calls contrapreneurs. So Brian Rose first popped up on my radar when I saw an advert for him for his business accelerator course, and it followed the exact same process to sell that course um, as all the other what I call entrepreneurs. So I, I broke down a formula. Having been to many of these events now, I've seen numerous get rich quick wealth creation gurus talk. Um, and they all use the exact same pitch in terms of, you know, um, their backstory, um, how they price the product. It's about scarcity and, you know, testimonials and so on. They all follow the exact same process. And I did a video called the entrepreneur formula and Brian Rose got mentioned in the comments on my most popular video. So that then alerted me to him. London Real runs eight-week courses, the Business Accelerator and the podcast course at $3,500 a pop, and also the Inner Circle, where people pay $15,000 for mentoring from Brian Rose. This summer, nearly the entire Inner Circle staged a revolution, signing this letter of complaint. One of them was Emma Baratti. So Emma, <laughs> you signed up to be part of London Real's Inner Circle. Can you talk about what that is and what your experience was of that? Yes, um, basically it's a mentorship, personal mentorship with um, Brian Rose. And um, you're supposed to work with him for six months. Um, it was promised as uh, entering a network of people, of successful entrepreneurs. So, you know, that was like the hook. So we all went in there thinking, okay, well, I'm starting my business. So, you know, he seems like a guy that knows his stuff because he's got so many followers. And at that time, his reputation was way better. And you got into some sort of a circle, which, you know, when you start a business, uh, networking is everything. So that's why we paid $15,000. And how did the experience live up to that? Well, the experience was that in the end, um, we had no mentorship whatsoever. It was a joke. Uh, the guy would appear, um, you would have basically three minutes with him every 15 days. And during those three minutes, he was so overtaken by his supposedly fight against freedom of expression. And uh, he would talk about himself. He was very full of himself. This we, we got very quickly. And in the end, the whole cause rebelled against him. We wrote a letter of protest and then we went into this uh, conference call in which we all thought that we, we were going to discuss the matter and we hoped he would be a reasonable man and say, you know, we, we, we can adjust or I can make some changes or refund or whatever. Before the call, they, they sent me a text and said, Emma, do you mind being the, the, our, our, our uh, speaker? And I said, yeah, I have no problem in, in voicing uh, the group's concerns. And, and then we go in there and it, there he is, you know, the photograph of him in absolute silence. And I was like really nervous, but at the same time pumping myself up because I, I knew I had to speak out, but I was intimidated. And then what happened is they announced him, he comes in and then we're cut off. I'm cut off. And then he, I get texts from the people in the, in the call. And one of them told me that he said that Brian actually said, you're lucky to even have three minutes with me. People queue to touch my hand. And that I think that's what triggered me off. I said, this man is out of, out of control. <laughs> this is just, you know, this is not normal behavior. It's just not. Two years ago, a Facebook group was set up for people who wanted to get their money back from London Real. It's now got about 270 members. I spoke to the man who set it up. When we started it up, uh, it, there was probably 40 or 50 people on the group that were active. Um, it's grown to 223 now. And so why did you create it in the first place? What were the concerns that you had originally? He, he used some very clever manipulation strategies. Um, and in fairness, some of the guys on the course that I was, I was on, they called it out really early on. And... Uh, and, and, and were, you know, it was very obvious to them what was going on. It probably took me another week, a week and a half of banging my head against the wall, realizing that this wasn't going anywhere. But um, one or two of the guys uh, really called it out early. And when they did, they were vilified. They were booted from the um, messenger group. They, uh, they, they were, we were told not to discuss 
the particular individual. Um, it, it and it was at that stage I realized this this is this is a joke. This is not something that uh, uh, it has any credibility and is uh, and he is using um, uh, all sorts of techniques to, um, to to keep control of the group, if you like. And um, and he did it very well. So, can you give some examples? When you uh, find yourself um, questioning anything he says, you got to push against that and call it resistance. And you got to push against it and say that um, this is not. He he will tell you that it's natural to do this um, or to feel this way, but you got to push through it. And um, and and anything else is uh, is is your that it's your fault that you're not able to do it. The persona that Brian had when we were on the course was you cannot challenge anything he said. But Brian at the moment seems to be kind of pitching himself as a, I mean, the whole thing about the digital freedom platform is like he's a free speech martyr. And a lot of yeah. people have commented that that's very paradoxical given the atmosphere within London Real. Yeah. What do you make of that? Have you, would you, yeah. would you agree? It, 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 absolutely. It's been as... It, 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 Brian, Brian talks about free speech, and um, yet uh, the experience that we had certainly on the course was anything but free speech or anything but an open forum for communication. You know, the whole um, I, I I might not agree with you, but I'll defend I'll defend your right to speak openly to the death catchphrase, whatever it is that he says. It really is. It's. It does make me laugh every time I hear him say it because uh, it couldn't be further from the truth. I wonder if you could go through, um, like, what are the core things that Brian Rose is doing that follow the entrepreneur playbook? Yeah. So first of all, it's um, it's it's that us and them mentality. So it's like weird difference with other people. He's using that tribal thing. He's jumped on a trend, which is uh, well, it was freedom of speech previously. And if you look, that's where his biggest spike was. Um, he has fake followers and fake reviews. And you can tell this by, if you look on Twitter, a lot of his support from Twitter accounts are accounts that were only um, joined Twitter in October 2020. If you look at the number of followers and subscribers he has, he's got 1.8 million when it comes to link, uh, when it comes to YouTube, sorry. So Brian's got 1.8 million followers on YouTube, but his videos receive on average less than 20,000 views. Now I've got a YouTube channel with 60,000 subscribers um, and my videos average more than Brian Rose's. I've never ever bought subscribers because I don't want to establish authority or credibility. So there's telltale signs. So he's got fake social proof. He's got fake um, followers. And then he's got a cause where he's identified a group that really need a leader or really wants leadership so he's targeted the vulnerable or that believe in a cause a lot of the techniques that mike's talking about we covered in a film with jamie wheel called how to spot a cult you know here's the culty cult checklist like this is the things not to do and if you are finding yourself in a community where a lot of these flags or alarm bells are going off just an encouragement slow your roll think twice Seek outside opinion, check your gut, check your heart, and know you're not crazy. And in a reality distortion field, hopefully this is a sort of a clearer signal you can perhaps index off. So the first one is, does the leader grab the one ring of power? And this is probably the most central um, and non-negotiable one. What does that mean in to grab the one ring? What's well, that? What it means, I think, is basically... Um, there's a Jungian psychologist, brilliant guy named Robert Johnson, and he has a, a great phrase for this, which is our golden shadows, right? And the idea of, it's not just our shadowy shadows, the dark stuff we disown and can't fess up to. There's our golden shadow as well, which is I can't be that great, but Tony Robbins can, right? I can't be that great, but Brad Pitt, you know, or Kylie Jenner, right? Have the capabilities, have the virtues, the things I value, but not me. And quite often, when we end up with charismatic gurus, they will light people up on stage or wherever they are, and people will puke. I and mean, this seems to be a, a reflex of tribal primates, right? We will puke our golden shadow onto the human who connects the circuit and lights us up. 
it's like little ducklings getting imprinted by the first face they see, right? And, and if you bring people into high self, true self, the first face they see is often the sage on the stage. Now, the one, grabbing the one ring is the equivalent of accepting that gold, right? Of saying, I am strong enough to hold it. Yes, I deserve it. I am that. And no matter how tempting that is, it's only a matter of time before that gold will drop that person to their knees. And this, by the way, does not require overt cults. This is chapter and verse, Info Marketing 101. Let's blow the smoke cannons. Let's get everybody up there weepily saying how much this thing has changed their life. And oh, wouldn't you know it, we're going to upsell the shit out of you on our premium program right fucking now. So we see these psychotechnologies deployed across the spectrum. So what's Brian Rose been up to to prepare for his bid for mayor? Coffeezilla, who I've spoken to before on the channel, has been doing a bit of detective work. He's been deleting a bunch of content ever since he announced his mayoral run here. When you delete a video that's part of a playlist, it doesn't actually, it still shows it as like unavailable. And you can get a good idea of what he deleted by what's no longer in video playlists. That's how this works. So I went looking through his playlist and I said, what is Brian Rose hiding? What's he been deleting lately? And what I found shocked me. Brian Rose has been deleting all the conservative podcasts that he had on his channel. This is Brian, I'll defend your death, you're right to say it, whatever. <laughs> Look at this. He deleted his Larry Elder podcast. Look, this video has been removed by the uploader. Oops. His Dan Crenshaw episode, his Dennis Prager episode, Candace Owens, but it's got a certain leaning to it, right? Because he's got other interviews that you might think of as maybe a little bit controversial. Uh, that are still up as long as they have left-wing views. But if they're a right-winger, then all of a sudden he removes them. Dave Rubin's removed. Here we go, Dave Rubin. But basically he's cleaning house of all the controversial he interviews. He's censoring himself and removing stuff off of his platform so people can't find it anymore, find out what he believes now that he's running for mayor. Look, even David Icke, Mr. David Icke, the guy who, who basically put Brian on the map, to be honest, Brian's career exploded when he got connected with David Icke. Where are all the videos with David Icke? There are 16, no, 15 deleted videos with David Icke. And the one that is still up, what it's called is, I, I don't agree with everything you say, but I'll defend to the death your right to say it. Apparently, only until it's politically inconvenient for him, and then he'll delete your video with him. Now, this is really fascinating because it suggests that Brian might be serious with this bid for mayor moving to a new audience. I knew that he was going to do this, right? Because grifters got a grift, and when they fail to come through on their promises, they have to move on to the next thing quickly, right? So this ties into one of the biggest topics that many of our interviewees on Rebel Wisdom have talked about, how big civilizations create sociopathic niches for bad behavior, and how that can become an existential threat as civilizations develop and decay. You have a, basically a series of phase transitions in game theory. So in the beginning, you have a, a group of individuals who are tightly coherent and are able to maintain their uh, ability to, to, I don't know if you know how the prisoner's dilemma works, but their ability to resolve the prisoner's dilemma by not defecting on each other. Now this happens due to um, very well-functioning, call it justice mechanisms, uh, meaning people have a felt sense that if they defect, they will have negative consequences. Right? So they, they feel like they're playing a multiple version of the prisoner's dilemma game, so that if they act badly, the consequences will come back to them, and so they choose to act well, and that generates the, the global optimum, which is better, and so this group is, is thrives. Right? So you've got a group that's working well. It can solve collective action problems effectively. And so what happens is that it grows. Right? It, it thrives, and so it grows. It brings new people in or expands its population on its own basis, whatever it happens to be. And so you might imagine, let's just make a simple version. The first version is an actual tribe. So this is a tribe and it's relating to nature. And what happens is that as it becomes successful, the tribe expands and it expands and expands and expands until the mechanisms that it originally used to close the loop on justice, to make sure that everybody um, took responsibility for not defecting, uh, become more and more attenuated until they start to open up little gaps, some possibilities where I can maybe get away with something and it won't affect, I won't have to bear the full cost. Or there's some reasonable probability that I won't have to bear the full cost. So the game theory starts to shift. 
So now you might imagine that the tribe was relating to nature, but now the tribe has become the niche. So what will end up happening is little tiny micro tribes will begin to emerge who are actually figuring out ways that they can develop local selective advantage themselves on the body or on the surface of the nation, of the, of the society. If you look around the poker table, you don't know who the sucker is that's you. That comes from this phase. So what ends up happening is that everybody begins to either be a sucker, in which case they're the ones who get their heads cut off, or they have to start being a player. Now, of course, as it's everyone becomes, that's a self-reinforcing feedback loop. And at that point, if you look around the table and literally everybody is looking for taking out the sucker except for you, then you're screwed, right? Then you're dead. So now you enter into the final stage. The final stage is what they call the fractal defection stage, which is the defection starts to eat at the very fabric of what holds the society together. And eventually, the entire thing is in fact actually put into jeopardy. Um, you can't trust anyone. You can't get anything done. Bureaucracy is hyper, hyper, uh, hypertrophied. Um, you have to assume that every interaction is an interaction of multiple layers of manipulation. Coordination costs go through the roof. Um, and again, the whole society collapses from the global optimum to the local optimum of prisoner's dilemma, and boom, you're done. This is the philosophy explicitly followed and taught by Brian's mentor, the billion dollar man, Dan Pena. I am jealous he came up with a scam before I did. Now making money is better than the 80s. And they say my generation ripped the ass out of the world uh, because of the 80s. And I, I was proud to be one of those that ripped it. And maybe that's where we are. A world where someone who operates as a zero trust player, looking for the sucker, trailing multiple accusations of fraudulent behavior, can succeed in politics. After all, revealing that Trump University was a scam didn't hurt his chances. Whatever else he is, Trump is the prisoner's dilemma of zero trust, egotism and game theory made flesh. Which is incidentally why I think the system has thrown up a character like Trump and that this is kind of the end times for game A. And that seems like a process that's being sped up by an actor like Trump, who is explicitly going from that perspective. Like one of, one of Trump's rules is you cannot trust anyone. And so he's, he's building that, that narrative into the, into the global system. Well, I, I think there's two things. Um, first is I'm going to put an asterisk next to Trump, which is to say that every quite quite often people try to think that they understand him. And so then they reify him into some sort of artifact that I certainly don't know him well enough to be able to say anything specifically about him. So what I can do is I can identify a particular character that has certain characteristics. Um, and so that's not a bad story. There's certainly a Trump character who shows up with those characteristics. You might say that he's the, uh, the embodiment of a particularly aggressive poker player who's happy to play chaos, right? And understands how to thrive in chaos. And fundamentally is kind of peak predator of fractal defection land. That's just where he comes from. And so for him, it's intuitive and sensible that one behaves in this fashion. And therefore, it's very effective in this stage, right? It's, you know, the Lannisters outcompete the Starks until chaos actually happens, right? Until winter actually comes, it's actually better to be a Lannister than a Stark in King's Landing. And so, but then, yes, this is the point. That makes it, it accelerates the process. You know, again, the, it's actually, sorry, I think you may have been pointed out something separate, which is equally important. If I am of that sort, if I'm playing that kind of game, it's in my interest to make sure the game is of that sort. So I actually have an interest to break the justice links, to make things more chaotic, because I thrive in that niche. I thrive in chaos. I don't thrive in order. In order, I might, in fact, be called out and, 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 and hung from the nearest tree. So I actually need to spin more chaos because that's where I thrive. So yes, you've got both my activities make more chaos, but then even intentionally, I have an invested interest in, in increasing the amount of chaos just because that's what I'm good at. In a way, the main issue here isn't so much that these characters find a niche and succeed. That's almost always going to happen. It's when everyone else in society concludes that this game of power and manipulation is all there is and stops caring. Rebel Wisdom isn't only about the ideas in the films, it's also about how we bring them into our lives. Which is why over the last few months, we've invested in developing the Rebel Wisdom community, our digital campfire. We've launched a new platform for discussion and connection, started regular meetups and practice sessions for members, plus Q and A's with some of the amazing interviewees we've had on the channel. So if you'd like to support Rebel Wisdom, 
to help us continue to make films and to find the others, maybe think about joining the Rebel Wisdom community. Thank you for watching.